care of the land, the land will take care of you. And so we have our traditional foods, our first foods, and our first foods is water, salmon, big game, roots, and berries. Then we have our medicines. And our treaty would not have been signed unless we had access to our first foods. Uh, in fact, at one point they were not going to give us access and we said we we're not going to sign our treaties. And for the Umatilla tribe, when we signed our 1855 treaty, it was, uh, we gave it 6.4 million acres. And like you said, it, the when you hear confederated, you know there's more than one tribe. And so when, you hear, uh, when I say confederated tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, there are three tribes, the Umatilla, Walla Walla, and uh, Cayuses. And then Nespers tribe is one, Yakima tribe is 14, and I think there's more than three for the, for the Warm Springs, but there are several tribes within the Columbia River Basin. And the four treaty tribes is how we get together. And generally they're called the Umatilla, Yakima, Nez Perce, and Warm Springs. And so they don't name all the tribes. But when our treaty was signed, like I said, we had to have access. And so we have a treaty right to, have, to harvest our first foods. And when we started in um, working with the states, I'll tell you, it wasn't great. Um, and the federal agencies, we had U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service who accepted their respons trust responsibility to the tribes. And so they worked with us on trying to figure out how you manage the, ocean, or the Columbia River stocks. And so we ended up, 14 tribal members took the um, Oregon to court and then uh, the, the, the four treaty tribes joined the case and then later on Washington joined the case at, at the same time. This court case was U.S. v. Oregon. It started, in, a decision was made in 1969, and it was just, uh, it was the longest federal court case uh, in the nation, but the judge just said, uh, I forgot how he worded it, but he said that this case is no longer an active case, although it is. We have a, uh, what we call a U.S. v. Oregon management plan for the Columbia River. It's the Columbia River Fish Management Plan. It's adopted by the federal court, and it, therefore it's a court order on how we manage our fisheries. When we first started, like I said, we went to BIA, and we said, uh, how do we get information on our salmon? Because we wanted to get fish back to our people, because people, as is, is that's how we live. It's part of our culture, part of our history, and part of our future. And we have three areas in which we have salmon, ceremonial, subsistence, and commercial. Ceremonial is always first. And ceremonial fish, we harvest our fish for our tribes. Uh, and some individuals come down and harvest them ourselves, but for the Umatilla tribe, we ha get a fisherman to harvest salmon uh, in April, time frame, and we take the spring chinook, we take them home, we vac clean them, vacuum seal them, and put them away for uh, memorials, weddings, uh, deaths, rejoinings, first foods, um, just any type of tribal gathering. We generally bring our salmon out, and it's in that order. We put the salmon, we have the water, the salmon, the big game, the roots and the berries and water. And that's how our food is served at the table. If you ever go to any of the tribal longhouses of the four treaty tribes, you will see that's how we serve our food. And when we come down uh, to serve our food, all of us will line up. Like if there's 10 tables, there'll be five girls or 20 girls because there's two tables. <laughs> and what we'll do is we'll have a, a plate of, uh, berries in each hand and we'll raise to thank the creator for bringing the food and then we'll turn and then we'll serve it all the way through the long house. It's the same with salmon. It's the same thing the men do with our salmon and our, our big game. But because it's so important, we were having, like I said, we were having problems getting information. And Don Hodel, who was the director of Bonneville Power Administration, said, I think tribes should have a seat at the table. And so he wanted to uh, give the four tribes some funding to, uh, do, to restore salmon. 
But he didn't want to give it to four tribes. He wanted to give it to one organization. And because we said, OK, we formed the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission. So it was established in 1977 and is still going. And that Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission is the four member tribes are the four treaty tribes. And they provide the technical information that we need. And I can tell you that we have told our technical information, our staff, we want the technical information to protect our natural resources. And they do that. Because uh, I remember in 1977, we were expecting a record run back to the Columbia River. We generally, in the fall season, we weren't having very many spring, oh, we had the last spring in 1977. We haven't had a summer season in a long time. And we were told in the 60s, I think it was the late 60s, early 70s, that if you four tribes would get off the river for four years, you will be able to fish on summer Chinook. We were off for over 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. And then we start, finally started fishing on, on summer Chinooks. So we pulled ourselves off the river, but at the same time, we knew that wasn't working. And so we um, developed our first USV Oregon management plan in 1977, and we also established our uh, Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission in 1977. And because of that organization, we were able to get the technical information we needed. And I tell you, in 1977, like I said, we were expecting a record run of summer ch or fall Chinook back to the Columbia River. We started in August. We were expecting to end in October. We had 13 days of fishing. And we went down there, and um, we were told there's no st uh, the preseason forecast did not show up. So we had to come back and tell our fishermen, no more fishing. And we do that because we're thinking of our children's and our children's children's seven generations and beyond. That's our responsibility as tribal leaders. So salmon is very important for our future, our past, and our culture. It's, it's all part of our history. On the Umatilla River, um, it was really interesting because when I first started, uh, we didn't have any salmon on the Umatilla <coughs> River. And in fact, our tribe said, let's plant some fish in the Umatilla River. And we planted coho. Um, we found out as our fish were going down the Umatilla River, they were being diverted into farms by irrigation ditches. So our smolts were in the irrigation ditches fertilizer for the, the, the food, food that they were growing. And so we tried doing it by ourselves. We tried to say, OK, we don't need to work with anybody. We can do this alone. Well, we found out then that we needed to develop partnership and collaboration. And so we worked really hard to rebuild our Umatilla River um, springs and summers, or springs and falls, and our coho. And when we first started going to these meetings, we had a room full of farmers. Why do you want water? You have no fish. Why do you want water? And, and they had a good point, but we said, you know, this is part of our culture, our history, and our future. We want to put fish back into the Umatilla River. And so um, I went to Oregon and asked Oregon if they would put fish back into the Umatilla River. And they said, why? You have no water. <laughs> <laughs> and so we had to work really hard. And we were really glad that we, like I said, we developed that partnership and collaboration. And we were able to get Bonneville Power Administration funding because we had six inches of water below Three Mile Dam. And what we did is we channelized that um, below Three Mile Dam so that the water would all go in one area so it would be, uh, ha we'd be able to get fish past the Three Mile Dam or up to Three Mile Dam and transport up to the headwaters of the Umatilla River. And in 19, mid 80s, we had one salmon, one spring Chinook salmon that returned and we were so thankful. 
we had a huge feast in our longhouse to celebrate. We had the farmers, we had Oregon and Washington, or Oregon and BPA, and we had, you know, just all the co-managers we could find to, to come who helped us rebuild us. And we made sure everybody got a little bite. And so, because we, we wanted to share that victory. Uh, I always liked the, one of our biologists, he said, you know, how many of you can say you tripled your run size in one year? <laughs> because the following year, we got three. <laughs> but it has been growing. So now we get over, over 3,000 into the Umatilla River. And we have an annual allocations with, we work out with the state of Oregon. So we have a 50-50 allocation. And in 1969, when Judge Baloney passed the decision that said that tribes could only be regulated by the states and the feds if it was for conservation. And so we adopt our own regulations for our tribal fishermen. And if it's for conservation, and we do that so we don't have the states and the feds adopting regulations for our fishermen. But we also do that because we want our salmon there for the next seven generations and beyond. And so when we, um, passed all, uh, the U.S. v. Oregon and, uh, and formed the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission, we became a much stronger organization <coughs> to fight to rebuild salmon. We have 39 stock, or 39 tributaries above Bonneville Dam. Some of them have extinct stocks, some of them are um, small stocks, and some of them are good. And in also, I, I guess in the 1980s, um, right after the Bonneville Power, or, uh, the, uh, Power Act was passed in 1980, there was a, a, a petition to list Mid-Columbia uh, Fall Chinook because they were a depressed run. And Noah reviewed that petition and decided, well, the Power Act was just passed. Let's see what the states, the tribes, and the feds can do. Now that mid-Columbia stock is the largest Columbia River stock in the Columbia River. You can, um, you will see, we've seen pictures when we first started, you did not see the reds that were on in the mid-Columbia River. And now you can see pictures of there's all kinds of uh, reds, and that's a natural stock. It's the only natural uh, spawning area in the Columbia River because of the dams. Um, the dams have created uh, pools, large pools. They've created water temperature problems, water quality problems, water passage problems for our salmon. But because of the court cases, uh, we are now getting them to um, provide spill. Uh, court cases require that spill occur from uh, April 1 to uh, August 31st. September 1, they don't have to do, uh, provide spill anymore. But until then, and that's because they believe technically, and we have shown some information, that our smolts are going down the river at that time. When the Power Act was first passed, it said April 15th to June 15th. That's the water budget. And I never heard of a water budget before. <laughs> so I asked, what is the water budget? And they said, that's when your fish are passing down and that's when we're gonna provide the spill that you need to get the fish down river. And we said, we need more time. And so it took us a while, it took court cases, but it finally happened. So now there's a uh, court, uh, court order that says from April 1 to August 31st. But also we have, like you said, um, we've invested a lot of money into our salmon. Our, and I think ours is not the only one, our, for the Columbia River, or for the uh, Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, our natural resources is the biggest department in our organization because they're looking at water, salmon, big game, roots, and berries. So all of those, and cultural resources, because whenever we have um, a proposed project on the, in our usual and custom area, on our reservation, we look to see, is this a culturally significant site? And if it is, 
then we plan plans to protect that site or to mitigate or to move, whatever. But we're, our intent is to protect our, our cultural um, artifact areas, our sites, those types of things. So our natural resources department is the biggest department in our reservation. And it's, some of it is funded by the tribe, some of it's funded by Bonneville Power Administration, and some of it's funded by the grants and other federal agencies. So, but we have that partnership now. Department of Energy, we have a partnership with them that we work to, re to protect and restore Hanford area, which we know is gonna take forever. <laughs> but at the same time, we're also protecting our sites over there. So water, salmon, big game, roots and berries are our first foods. And what's more important, we work really hard to protect our treaty rights, our first foods. But we also recognize that in doing that, we're creating an ecosystem that is being shared by everyone. I mean, I, I've gotten into discussions with salmon people. He so says, your treaty rights are old. They're, save the salmon can in Indian. In fact, I walked through partic, uh, picket lines for that. And, they'd, and Judge, Bologna, <laughs> Judge Bologna, like he said, he made the decision and this is, Judge Bologna is full of baloney. <laughs> 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 but uh, when we, st during the fish wars, which was from the 69s up to probably the late 70s, we were in a lot of um, conflict with the states and the federal agencies. But we turned around, and we also turned the, the uh, gillnet fishermen in the lower river around as well, and some of the sportsmen um, as well, to say, your treaty rights are good for us as well, because 50% of that harvest is harvested by non-Indian fishermen, whether it be sportsmen or a commercial fisherman. And we count that 50% from the Canadian border down up to the headwaters, or uh, up to um, Lower Grant, Granite Dam. So, but it's, when it gets into different states, there's a little bit different allocation, but at the same time, we have learned to count those things. And quite frankly, we haven't been able to catch 50% of our harvestable salmon in a very long time simply because we have 14 stock, or 24 uh, stocks in the Columbia River. 13 of them are listed under the Endangered Species Act as threatened or endangered. And so we are working really hard to rebuild those endangered stocks, not just for us, but for you. And um, just recently, I heard that the, uh, there's an international treaty that's moving forward. And this is a first, I'll tell you, that uh, when I was working in those negotiations, uh, we asked the federal agencies to step up and ask the ocean fisheries to protect mm -hmm. the endangered species stocks. Um, they didn't do that. This agreement is doing that. And so they're looking at how they can uh, protect those endangered species stocks. I also tell you there's a real difference in management because when I first started, I went and asked one of the Oregon representatives, why do you start from Labor Day to Memorial Weekend for the ocean fisheries? That's when they want to go fishing. And I said, what about the stocks? What about the, I mean, we're not getting enough fish back to our, our tributaries for spawning, for recruitment. What about them? Well, they, they, we ended up taking them to court for several years. And now the ocean fisheries is managed stock by stock, area by area. It's no longer a Memorial weekend to a Labor Day weekend. It's by areas, so they determine where the stocks are at and how they can best protect them. And all of this also is, um, you know, we are not only working on harvest, but we're like working on habitat. We're working on in-stream flows for salmon, uh, 
for the uh, for the Walla Walla Basin. One of the things that we're doing right up there, and you know, Walla Walla River goes from Oregon to Washington. We got tributaries Mill Creek that goes from Washington, goes into Oregon, and comes back into Washington. And so that basin has needs both Oregon and Washington, the Umatilla Tribe, the states of Oregon and Washington, uh, water managers and um, fish managers, plus we need the stakeholders. And we're working with them, and I'm really pleased to say that it's taken a decade, and then some. <laughs> I think it's been over two decades, but um, when I first went into the Walla Walla Basin with our biologists, they wanted to know, what are you doing here? What do you want? And we said, we want to rebuild salmon in the Walla Walla Basin. And they said, why? They said, because this is where our treaty was signed. This is where we used to come fish. And we haven't fished in there in over 100 years. And so um, this year, I'm really pleased to say that the Washington departed, uh, Washington provided $500,000 to the Department of Ecology to do a flow study that's needed for the Walla Walla Basin. And it's supposed to be completed by June of, of next year. And once we've got that study completed, we're going to be able to say, OK, we need information here. We need information there. How are we going to get that information so we can protect, restore, and rebuild our water and our salmon in the Walla Walla Basin? Our water, we know, is not just our water. We know there are a lot of people who want water. We know it's important for our lives. But we also know that unless we take care of it, we are not going to be able to survive. Water is life for everyone. A lot of people don't eat salmon like we do. But water is what everybody needs. And so that's why we are pushing really hard to improve things in the Walla Walla Basin so that we have good water quality, good water temperature. So it will benefit not only the people, but the salmon in the Walla Walla Basin. We are going to be working on an integrated plan for the Walla Walla Basin. And it's going to include Oregon, Washington, and all the co-managers and stakeholders. It's not going to happen overnight. <laughs> we know that because we've done that in the Umatilla River. It did not happen overnight. It took us a while. And so that's what we're going to be pushing for in the Walla Walla Basin is to develop a plan that would, so that all of us hopefully get our needs uh, for salmon, for farms, for urban life, and all of those things that water is so important for. And that's why it's so hard. Um, to take time, because we'd like to have it overnight. <laughs> but we also know that it's, it's, it only happens if we have support. If we have people who are saying water and fish are important. And we need, need people to say to work together, to develop that collaborative approach, so that we can do these things together. I know I've talked to some of the non-Indian organizations and, and I said, you know, it's better for us to do this together than to have NOAA where we have stocks that are listed, steelhead, and bull trout. And steelhead is under uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, or no, bull trout is under U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and, and steelhead is under NOAA. I said, how would you like it if they came in and say, you can't use this water because of the fish? It's better for us to develop a plan to say, this is how we are going to protect, restore, and enhance the water within that basin, within any basin, quite frankly, so that we are looking at all the needs in that basin. So it's, it's a huge... Um, planning effort, but the tribes do this because it's our future, it's our culture, it's our history, and it's part of our treaty rights. And we tell the tribal members that 
we, we are working hard to protect our treaty rights. We have to provide that opportunity. But we're not always able to provide that opportunity. Just like the young man said, sometimes these seasons are closed. And we close them because we want those fish to go upriver. We want to have them restored. And we want to be able to fish in the future. So, you know, we take our natural resources very seriously because this is what our treaties told us we had to do, is to protect those. And I've made speeches where I've said, okay, if this was my reservation and I can draw a straight line, make it a cube, and this was my reservation, I would have good clean water, good clean land, and I have good salmon, big game, roots and berries. But my water, my air, doesn't stay in this cubicle. <laughs> Neither does my salmon or our big game. And so that's why it's so important to have that collaboration, that partnership, so that we all are working for our future. I know Oregon was one of the first in the nation, and I'm really proud to say Oregon was the first in the nation to adopt a fish consumption based on tribal consumption. They went from 16.5 grams per day to 175 grams per day, and they based it upon our consumption. But they also recognized that tribes were not the only ones who consumed that much fish. And so we're working with um, Washington and Idaho to do something similar, but at the same time, the industries are coming in and say it's going to it's going to cost us too much. I don't know of any industries that left Oregon because of the fish consumption rate. No. So those are examples, but those are some things we all have to look at as to how we can protect our environment so we can all survive. Because quite frankly, if we don't, we're going to have Hanford. And who wants to live on Hanford? I don't. <laughs> And because Hanford has so many contaminants that it's going to take us millions of years to clean it up. And we're not going to see it in our lifetime. So when we look at our land, our water, our air, this is what we're planning for for the next seven generations and beyond. And like I said, we know that when we plan for these types of things, it's not just the tribes who benefit from them. It's the Pacific Northwest. It's all of us. There are 24 tribes in the state of Washington, nine tribes in the state of Oregon, and I think there are nine tribes in the state of Idaho. I'm not sure on that one. But, <laughs> but you know, we have all worked together in so many different areas. Columbia River Treaty, when the treaty was signed in 1964, had looked at flood control and hydro operations. In 2013, the 13, 15 Columbia River tribes approached the states of Oregon and Washington and Idaho and the federal agencies to say, we need to have ecosystem management added to that. And we were successful in getting a white paper that was delivered to the U.S. Our Department of Interior that said ecosystem should be included in the Columbia River Treaty. Now where it goes now, that's all what we're going to be finding out in the future. But we need everybody's support to say ecosystem is important for not only just the tribal future, but your future, your children's future, and their children's children. I know when we had the fish consumption discussion, we had some paper industry come into our room. And our boardroom was about this side, and it was full. And we had the pulp industries telling us that, you're impacting my economy. I'm not going to make as much money. And for what you're asking us to do is not going to really prove a benefit because it's going to be a million dollars just to see a little uh, increase to protect the water. Oh, so we listened to them. 
you know, we didn't argue with them. We understood where they were coming from. But then we asked them, what are you going to tell your grandchildren when they can't drink that water? They no longer objected because everybody needs to think about the future. Our natural resources are here for all of us. And sad to say, many of us are cleaning up what our grandfathers did, but okay, that's what we're doing. But we're doing it together through partnership and collaboration. And I know sometimes it's really difficult to work with tribes, but I can tell you sometimes it's really difficult to work with states and federal agencies too. <laughs> Uh, but at the same time, you know, that's the tribal goal, is to protect our natural resources, all of them, for the next seven generations and beyond, which includes you and the tribes. So the Pacific Northwest is important to us. It's important because we all live here. I know um, one of the discussions I had with one of the, <laughs> the federal agencies was, I was saying, you need to work with us more. You need to step up and start protecting. You know, there's timber clear cutting going out on our Umatilla Reservation. And you need to tell them not to do that because this is where endangered species are at. And he said, well, you know what, Kat? You guys are doing a great job. I said, no, but we need your help as well. And then I finally just looked at him and I finally said, you're leaving. You're able to leave, but we are not. Tribes do not leave our reservation. We have some tribal members who are off the reservation, but the majority of our people live on the reservation, along with other tribes. We have tribal members who are married to other tribal members. Just like the young man was saying, I am the same way. I've got, I'm Cayuse, but I'm also Alaskan. I'm also Grand Ron, and I'm also Nez Perce, because my parents came from different tribes. And that's how we are. So, but at the same time, we are all fighting for the same thing. Have you any questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, the Columbia River starts in Canada. Right. And you did mention Canada in one of the treaty or working on some... Like Columbia some River Treaty. I, I'd be interested in the relationships with Canada in all this. The yeah. Well, there's two treaties with Canada. One that was signed in 1985, and it was called the Pacific Salmon Treaty. And this was a, uh, a treaty that managed the ocean fisheries from three to 200 miles out from the coast. The states and, the, and Canada manage from zero to three. I think it's three. And anyway, then, then it's kind of an international area. And so that Pacific Salmon Treaty established some goals to rebuild stocks. And Fraser River, Columbia River were two of the most important stocks uh, that were identified in that treaty. So those treaties having to do with the Columbia right. are also including Canada. Right. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is because they catch Columbia River stocks. And we catch Fraser River stocks. And our fish go all the way up to southeast Alaska as well. And so sometimes our biggest fighters are Alaska. <laughs> but, and, but at the same time, they are part of the United States. So we have to uh, develop a US position that includes Alaska. And, and on the, the, the other one, the Columbia River Treaty, is a totally different one. They are not even looking at salmon. It looks at hydro operations and flood control. And we are asking them to look at ecosystem management so that they can look at how to protect the ecosystem as well. So that 
you know, so we've got some information going on that, but at the same time, that is not a completed treaty. That, that is a treaty that's just now starting, okay? Because we've just gotten a uh, Department of State to say we've got a, a lead negotiator, and they're oh, going to... Oh, the Columbia, Columbia River Treaty? Oh, no. The oh. Columbia River Treaty is going to include 15 tribes, the states of Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Montana, and then Canada, okay. and then uh, the First Nations in Canada. And that's just looking at uh, Columbia River operations into Canada. Okay. okay? Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, sir. Well, that Columbia River Treaty is up and being negotiated. How is it affected by the dispute over, uh, over the trade agreements and the Trump order? I mean, it, it oh boy. By oh, it's going to be complicated and by it. The other one is, I remember during the next administration, they were very friendly to tribes. A lot of things got passed then, probably right. accidentally, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> No, we're not. <laughs> well, when you, well, when you see uh, Obama, uh, Obama had taken the position that he wanted to look at climate change because he knew that our ecosystem was changed. Trump has taken it off the agenda, and so he doesn't even want to look at it. And I remember when we were, it took us five years to get the uh, Pacific Salmon Treaty negotiations completed. And in one of those years we were negotiating, the uh, Canada uh, was upset because the U.S. was wear raising tariffs on the lumber. Had nothing to do with fish, but boy, did it have an impact on our meeting. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure that when the Columbia River Treaty starts getting negotiated, they're going to bring in those tariffs and they're going to bring in other issues. But hopefully, uh, our our leaders are going to be focused on the Columbia River. And that's what we had to do within the Pacific Salmon Treaty. We had to remind them that this is a salmon treaty. This is not a lumber treaty. And yes, we know that's impacting this, the Canadians. But at the same time, that's not our responsibility. And so we had to finally get them to recognize they need to work on salmon. But it took us a while to get that moving forward again because of the outside impacts um, between Canada and, U and the U.S. So it'll have an impact. I mean, the Columbia River Treaty um, is just barely getting started, but with all the tariffs and the lack of looking at climate change, it's going to have an impact. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay.